This is our room. For $3 a night, you get a bed and a fan. It's really cheap, really basic, but it's everything you need and it's clean. And I don't know what's going on right now. I'm gonna go take a look, but they're sectioning off a place down there. So the police are all standing out there and they have the yellow tape out. So hopefully no one's hurt, but uh, I'm gonna go take a look. So this is two doors down from where we're staying. And we're hearing now that there's a tourist that passed away in here. I don't know, someone said he got shot. Someone else said he's been in his room for a week because of, I guess, a drug overdose and just died no notice. I don't know what happened, but I'm just glad we didn't stay here. This is some CSI Cambodia. They've got like the fingerprint duster and they've got their masks on. They've got a little magnifying glass. I have no idea what they're doing. They probably don't know what they're doing either, but anyways, they're trying to solve a mystery. I just heard from one of the locals that uh, the guy's been in his room for a week now, so the body's just been sitting there. Laura and I are having breakfast. I just had uh, bacon, eggs, and ham, and toast, and a coffee for $2.50. Foreigners aren't allowed motorbikes in uh, in Cambodia. Yeah, I just found that out. So we couldn't even could, rent No, you, you'd get ticketed if they saw you on the bike. So, and we have our visas being processed now for Vietnam. You can get that done at most guest houses, which is kind of unusual, but in Phnom Penh, it's like the next city, big city until you get to Vietnam. But they'll process it in a day. So, yeah, we're paying $62 per visa. Okay, two dollars. No. <laughs> one dollar. No, you can pay one dollar. Yeah, it's five dollars. Oh, far away, mate. Oh. <laughs> oh. It's a good deal for you, five dollars. No, far away. See you. The Tuk Tuk drivers are predators. They literally wait for white people to come out and then they swarm. And then they, they offer you like crazy high prices. And sometimes people say yes, that's why they offer or they ask for so much. But uh, if you're a good negotiator, you keep saying no, and they'll follow you. Oh, and he's still following us. He's tr we, we're asking for five dollars to get us there, and they started at like twenty, and now we're down to eight dollars. But we want more off, so we'll find a we'll find the right price eventually. And, and we finally found one for five dollars. We just got dropped off at the genocidal site. I'm gonna try some of this. So they run it through a crushing device and they squish out all the juice from the sugar cane. So for 25 cents, I've gotten a drink. This kind of tastes like what I would have expected. It tastes a bit like a tree, but a sweet tree. I don't know if I like it. So we're now here in the Killing Field site, and for six US dollars, you actually get one of these devices, so you can actually get a guided tour around the site. So it'll be interesting to hear what really happened here. So what I've just heard is that in 1975, Pol Pot, which was the genocidal leader, basically took over uh, Cambodia. And he separated families, he sent people off into the farms to work, he killed millions of people. And uh, the narrator of this cassette is talking about how his family of nine were all sent in different directions. And he went four years without seeing them until in 1979, Cambodia was basically freed from the leader. And when he was reunited with his family, I think he said five of the nine family members had been killed. So he only saw his mother and father and young sister after that. Between the years of... 1975 and 1979, three million of the eight million Cambodians were killed. So that's three out of every eight people. That's huge numbers. And uh, basically what happened was Pol Pot forced everyone out of the cities. He closed down all the cities, closed down the entertainment, the offices, and basically tore all these families apart and set them off to do forced labor and agriculture. And families weren't kept together, so you were just basically picked and sent off to a random collective farm is the term and you're forced to work day and night with poor feeding and poor housing basically treated like a slave. Pol Pot and his communist government basically had anyone who was educated so anyone that knew a foreign language, anyone that was a doctor, a lawyer, anyone with soft hands or wore glasses um, they were all brought here and executed because basically anyone with some form of education or were taught to think were kind of a threat to his empire and his uh, government that took over Cambodia. And so they were brought here and I guess eventually there were so many people coming here every day that they didn't even have time to kill them the same day that they arrived and so they were kept in basically a giant wooden cell. I guess right here is where the site was where they kept all the chemicals and so right after executing someone um, they would cover their body in chemicals for two reasons. To get, get rid of the stench so that people wouldn't get suspicious as to what was going on here and also to kill off any people who were buried alive and so Basically, people were just being killed every night and uh, taken out of their holding cells and, yeah, buried in this field here. 
As I said earlier, um, the government was basically taking anyone that was educated and executing them, and they were actually torturing them as well until they admitted to being spies or to have being disobedient to the government or having stolen rice, even though they never did any of these things. But they were basically tortured until the point where they confessed to these false claims so that the government could legally kill them. Uh, they also tortured these people until they admitted that their family members were spies or anything else just so the torture would end and that they would finally be killed. The video kind of, you know, said it, although it may sound like a betrayal to say your family member is a spy as well, but at, the, at that point, months into torture, who's to blame them? It's just so sad to hear what they were forced into. It's unbelievable. This all happened only 40 years ago that thousands and thousands of people were killed here, millions. And uh, this site here, the Killing Field, has 20,000 people confirmed to have been buried here over six acres so that's not a lot of land and basically they were just being efficiently uh, killed and disposed of in these pits um, it's yeah it's tragic uh, the audio tape also says that up ahead you'll see cloth you'll see bones and basically talked about how although it's sad to see now and things almost seem peaceful here if you're if you ignore what what is really lying below I can see some some cloth remains from the bodies that were buried here. It says that uh, basically through rain and flooding, a lot of the people who were buried, a lot of their stuff has come up. So teeth, bones, cloth. So the tools that they use for executing these people weren't bullets because bullets were far too expensive. And so they use things like bamboo poles, hammers, axes, machetes. So these were not peaceful deaths. These were some of the most gruesome things that you could have seen. Um, and eventually the government actually was uh, defeated and they retreated so a lot of the Khmer Rouge which were which was the uh, communist government that was in place at the time they once they defeated they all kind of hit uh, ran away into the countryside before they could be captured and charged for their war crimes the Pol Pot's motto was better to kill an innocent by mistake than to spare an enemy by mistake and really what Pol Pot was doing was he was paranoid to lose control of Cambodia and so he was just killing as many as 300 people here a day um, in the highest in the heights of the massacre. You can actually see the land depressions like there. There's a couple over there. There's about five way back there. And these are where the mass graves were. Um, they were dug as deep as 16 feet with as many as 300 people, I believe, being buried in each. The site was discovered after the Khmer Rouge's occupation. They were able to study the bones and the remains and they figured that there was six Americans uh, two French and Australian and a few other Westerners who were buried here as well. During the time of the Khmer Rouge the entire Cambodian country was really shut off to everyone except diplomats and they actually had their borders with Vietnam and Cambo uh, Vietnam, Laos and Thailand totally shut off and they actually lined the entire borders with landmines and that's why today you actually see a lot of the landmine survivors who have accidentally come across these landmines and lost limbs uh, many were killed as well in trying to dismantle all the landmines that were set up by the Khmer Rouge. As soon as Pol Pot took over government, he seized all the property and land of all the farmers, all the city livers, and he basically commanded that the rice production had to be tripled overnight. And so people were kicked out of the city, all their possessions were taken and banned. Uh, anyone found with anything other than the clothing on their back and a bowl for their rice was basically executed. And so. People who were used to living in the city were just all of a sudden thrown out here into working on a farm where they had no training and they had to work over 12 hours a day, seven days a week with no training, no breaks, and had to live on two bowls of rice a day. And so that didn't go well. Um, rice production did not increase as much as commanded and at the end of the day, it actually, people worked, uh, worked themselves to death because they were terrified of the punishment. The leaders of the farms were also terrified of Pol Pot if they didn't meet their rice quotas and so they basically forced their workers to work even harder to the point where many died of starvation and disease. So this is since the excavation of 1980. These are all bones, teeth and cloth that have come to rise as the water has washed away the dirt. There's a bunch of bones up here. A lot of the cloth was either used as blindfolds or handcuffs to keep people tied their hands tied together. Uh, you can actually see some shorts in there that look like they belong to a child. So very, very moving to see all that. 
I just heard that after Pol Pot basically ran away, fled from Cambodia, whatever was left of the Khmer Rouge followed him and they went to the Thai border. And I think from what I heard, he lived a good life until he died. He was actually recognized as the leader of Cambodia, even when the government was overthrown. So even in 1985 or so, like years after they had been overthrown, he was still given a seat or his party was still given a seat in like UN, lots of different global organizations. So obviously they never really fully lost power, which is pretty disturbing to think about. This is called the killing tree because when women and children were thrown into this pit here, uh, the children were actually basically grabbed by the legs and swung into the tree and beaten against it. And so when someone discovered the tree, they said they saw hair, blood stains, and brain bits that were actually still on the tree. This vlog might not be for everyone. It's really not a positive note vlog, but it's it's the history of Cambodia. It's uh, a lot of the suffering they've seen, and this is just a glimpse of the genocide. This is only just one of the three major killing fields. Most of the population didn't suffer through the killing fields. It would actually happen through being worked to death, through starvation, through being taken away from families. And uh, yeah, the, the country has seen a very, very rough history. And this only happened 40 years ago. One of the most moving things of this whole thing has actually been hearing about this. This is the magic tree. And this is the tree that they hung massive speakers from to basically disguise from the outside world what was going on. One of the most moving things of this whole uh, tour through this killing fields has actually been hearing this part. So this is the magic tree. And in the magic tree, they hung massive speakers. And the speakers were used to drown out the sound of people moaning and screaming as they were killed here. And so it was for two reasons. It was to disguise from the outside world. Uh, so those outside of the killing field, they thought that this was just where Pol Pot held meetings and they would blast communist uh, revolutionary music so people wouldn't really hear what was going on. But it was also to prevent the other prisoners and captives from hearing what was going on. And they actually played the sound that you would hear if you were in their shoes. So they played the music that people basically heard before they died, as well as the diesel generator that was powering the speakers. Actually really eerie to hear and uh, kind of put yourself in the shoes of those who would have been hearing that music and generator just before dying. So here we are walking down a path and you can actually see some cloth starting to surface. There's bone right there too. Oh, that's bone. you're right. Yeah. yeah, there's bone and cloth just here on the pathway. That's just obviously one of the thousands of people that were killed here. There's more cloth, another cloth there. So we are standing right now where years ago people were slaughtered and thrown. You can see the bottom jaw as well as the tooth there just half jutting out of the ground now. This stupa, which is the large building, is the final stop in the Killing Fields tour. And from what I can hear, there's 9,000 skulls that are placed on 10 different levels up in the stupa. It actually has um, them categorized based on how they were killed. So some of them will have cracks in the skull from a machete. Some will have an actual uh, hole in the skull from a hammer. On the upper levels, they have other bones as well. But they said they have so many different bones that only 9,000 skulls and a few other selected bones could fit in this building. And here are some of the foot shackles. So just basically rebar wrapped around their ankles so that they weren't able to escape. So these are all the skulls of people who are 40 to 60 years old. And those with the red sticker are male and those with the, perp the blue sticker are female. It's kind of creepy as storms just picking up as I come through the final destination. So this one looks like it was a hammer because it's got a massive indent and almost a crack. So there's an axe, an iron tool, a hook knife, iron tool. Some were even killed just by getting hit with bamboo sticks. None of these killings were done peacefully. They were all done with basically what would be considered farmer's tools. Clearly all the skulls show that there was lots of head trauma. Couldn't be a more fitting way to end this tour. It's like turning into almost like a storm here. Very, very sad, but it's such a well done memorial. There's actually 
300 killing fields across the country that have been uh, found. This is the largest of all of them. There's three main ones and um, some of them are actually so remote that they're actually surrounded by landmines and they've never been able to excavate them. So the true number count of how many people have died to the killing fields is unknown. But as I said before, 3 million out of 8 million of the Cambodian population was killed. So it's just a horrific, a, span of a horrific thing to happen over, especially it happened over three and a half years. Yeah. Seriously could not be a more fitting end to this. Just as we're done the tour, it starts to rain and it's starting to rain pretty hard. I could see it pouring any second now. If there's anything about Southeast Asia, it's that once it starts raining a bit, it turns into a crazy rain that you've never seen before. I've heard a bit of thunder and it's such a humid day, so I'm expecting a good sized storm. And banana? Mm. Here come the rain. Banana. We call it banana. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.